technical difficulties, so got to uh, start with the chart again. But as I was uh, sharing about my loneliness struggle with Betty, he started drawing this diagram, and he would call these cul-de-sacs, you know, so this would be me doing whatever I can to alleviate loneliness. And so, you know, I would call this the scramble. It's like, okay, so here I am, going to be quarantined, not see people for a while. So let me just try and get all my ducks in a row. Like, oh, I want to see this. Or what can I do? Blah, blah, blah. What can I do to not feel this? To not live in the tension that of what surfaces when I'm lonely. And so Buddy was just saying that what it does when I go into the scramble, basically it just kind of shoots you back out to this path that leads you up more and more towards having to face the tension within you of what loneliness suffers or um, surfaces. And so some of the things that loneliness surfaces or the tension, the tension of living and facing and looking at loneliness and seeing it as an invitation to move from loneliness to solitude. Some of the things that surfaces is pain. It surfaces pain. It also surfaces our longing. So our longing, the tension surfaces the longing. Again, that tension is that place where it's not alleviated. The, the struggle is not alleviated. But God, it's kind of that wrestle. It's that place like where Jacob was wrestling with God. It's that place. We can feel really disoriented in that tension. We could feel weary. Uh, we could see our demands, our demands to make life work on our own terms. Uh, we can see the scrambling and, and the franticness of us trying to alleviate. And that comes out so many different ways. Um, if fed wrongly, it can lead to secrecy and addiction. And loneliness really can, that tension there, can feel a little bit like the wilderness. But the thing is, when you think about the wilderness, what is the first thing that happened with Jesus after he was baptized? It's the Holy Spirit led him to the wilderness. But sometimes we think things are the enemy when they're not the enemy. They're actually God leading us to some place that might look barren, but ultimately it's for our good and so much comes from it. Like some things that come from, you know, living through the tension, not just avoiding it, is, you know, our longing shows us that we're alive. Um, it can give us perspective. It can begin to orient our life towards the things that are important and on God's heart because we're, we're quieted. Um, the things that the gift that can come from realizing we're demanding is a release, is a release and a right ordering of our heart and our affections. Um, when we're scrambling to try and not feel what we're feeling, it also invites us to quiet and to mystery. To be like, we don't know what God's up to, but I trust he's up to something. It also surfaces our hunger. And our hunger for more than what um, this world can offer. It really does. But also, sir, a hunger it gives us a hunger for real and rich community. And how we can participate in that. So, um, I just, I think through a couple of things, it's what do you do when you're lonely? What do you do when you're lonely? What do you do with it? Do you feel like you have to do anything with it? You know, and this isn't flippant, I say this, is like Jesus on the cross, he knew a loneliness that we will never understand. And I say that not to short circuit what you're feeling or or the wrestle of loneliness. I say that is, oh my word, that's such an invitation to know that he he can um, understand our sufferings in, in this. And this too, I, I do want to speak to my single friends for a minute because um, James Houston, who was a disciple of C.S. Lewis, and he's, I think, 97 years old. He's still alive. And I met him a couple of years ago. And he equated singleness to the sufferings that the early church um, Christians, 
to the sufferings of persecution. Ugh, I can't find my words, you guys. Hang with me. He equated singleness as a suffering. And he equated it to the persecution that the early believers in the, in the early church, the first church, that they experienced. And I'm like, how does this married man understand that singleness is a suffering? Because it is. It really is. It's also, there are a lot of gifts to it. But I just want you to know, I see you. <laughs> I get it. It is a suffering. Um, and so I, I just, yeah, I have such compassion. So just a couple of thoughts uh, before I wrap up is that in Psalm 143, which this verse just jumped off the page to me a few months ago, and I've repeated it over and over. And during these times of loneliness and especially for the next few weeks as you are, you know, quarantined away, might be in isolation. It says, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. And the spirit inside of us is good. He is good. He will lead us on level ground. And so I think ultimately it's like, we can't fight so hard. We can't fight so hard against feeling lonely. But let God take you to that place of living in the tension and wrestling and see what comes out. And there really is a place of hope. It really is. There's hope in it. And uh, some other just real practicals um, is to make a phone call. Think through and ask God for faces. Like who could use encouragement? Pay attention to when somebody's face or name comes to your mind and you don't know why, I would reach out. I would see that as a prompt. Send a package through Amazon. Send a text. A gift, a real gift right now is asking questions of one another in our loneliness. Just ask questions. Be genuinely curious about the other person. Uh, there's some podcasts on this. I listened to one earlier. It's called uh, The Potter's Inn. And it's called the lone. It's called loneliness in the soul, and I thought it was really fascinating. It was encouraging. So the Potter's in loneliness in the soul. I wanted to close with another liturgy. I mentioned this yesterday on my Facebook Live, but this you can get at every moment holy. This is a book of liturgies by Douglas McKelvey, and you can get it every moment holy, or I think even the rabbit room. Uh, I think it's store.rabbitroom.com. And I just wanted to share this with you. There are all sorts of, of liturgies. There's a liturgy for too much information, a liturgy for morning coffee, for changing diapers. But the one I want to read to you today is a liturgy before a meal eaten alone. You created us for companionship. O oh God, for the sharing of burdens, for the joining of celebrations, for the breaking of bread and fellowship. And so it is not unnatural that we should taste a particular sorrow when eating a meal alone. Sit with me and linger at the solitary table, O oh Lord. Sit with me as my father. Sit with me as my brother. Sit with me as my shepherd. And sit with me as my friend. In the absence of human companions, may I know more fully your presence. In the silence where there is no conversation, may I more clearly hear your voice. Use my own momentary loneliness to work in me a more effectual sympathy for others who are often alone and who long for a companionship of their God and of his people. Let me afterward be more intentional in the practice of hospitality. Let me sometimes be the reason the loneliness of another is relieved. Meet me now in my own loneliness, O Lord. Meet me in this meal. I receive it as your provision for my life in this hour. Amen.